The world of food and agriculture has been incredibly chaotic in the past five years. We've seen record prices in crops like maize, wheat, and soybeans. This incredible, volatile, and high price environment has meant um, roughly a billion people are in food insecure states right now. And this is coupled with climate variability as well as climate change. Agriculture is very dependent on weather in any location. And if climate changes in that area, you'll see potentially adverse impacts on the, the production in that area and the livelihoods of the people there. And if that affects markets and prices, that could also affect a lot of the poor. The mission of the Center on Food Security and the Environment is to improve food security around the world. And that means, how are we going to feed 7 billion people now or 9 billion people in the future and do so without destroying the environment? We're really interested in the global food system as a whole, both on the supply side and the demand side. And what that means is really we try to learn about and work in all of the major regions that exist globally. It's about spending enough time in the countries so that you know the history, the culture, what works, what doesn't work. You have to empower people and put it in, in their terms. There's a lot of other groups who do great analysis, but never actually go into the field. And there are some groups who go into the field, but may only have a single disciplinary approach. The center is really different in that it is interdisciplinary. What Stanford University is doing is bringing together our disciplines and encouraging us to work together. And in doing so, we don't just focus on understanding the problem, but we focus on trying to find solutions. We often need the help of lawyers, physicians, hydrologists, biologists, ecologists. We have increasingly brought in climate scientists, both from this university and from several others, to help in our work more generally and specifically in Indonesia. In Indonesia, lately we've been working with the government officials on how to actually achieve stable prices in an era of very unstable climate and climate variability. And we've developed models that use sea surface temperature data and actually predict, starting in August, which is the beginning of their main crop season, what the crop is likely to be six months out. If they know they're going to be several million tons short, they can actually arrange for imports ahead of time. One of the things we strive to do here at FSC, I think, is to come up with very specific and practical recommendations for policymakers. We don't want to just say climate change requires a lot of adaptation. We want to be very specific in saying here are the three or four things that we could really do to help adapt to climate change. Our center is working in Benin, West Africa, on a system of solar powered drip irrigation systems. And the issue here is that most of Sub-Saharan Africa is rain-fed, has a long eight or nine month dry season where malnutrition really peaks. What's needed is small scale distributed systems that can reach the poorest communities in particular. And what we have found in our system, it's irrigating crops that can deal with some of the biggest malnutrition problems. I think our project in Benin is really motivated by a look at the science and understanding where climate change impacts are likely to be hardest. We're really trying to understand not only the economic impacts, but, but the broader impacts as well in the community. We don't just focus on production agriculture, we really focus on the demand side too. For example, how is the use of crop-based biofuels going to drive up prices? In the United States, we're using 40% of our maize crop in ethanol production. Once you put that much into the gas tank and take it away from the food table, it puts a lot of pressure on prices. People are beginning to understand the spillover effects. And there, there is increasing caution now, I think, about devoting more and more of the corn crop in this country to ethanol. There's really no mistaking the fact that we have some major challenges ahead. And I think understanding the most efficient use of our resources, given that we know resources will be scarce, is really a huge challenge, but it's, I think, in the end, going to be possible if we really uh, devote our energy to it. A lot of our focus is on training the next generation of leaders in this field. It's really key for us not only to train Stanford students, but to train people throughout the world. What pleases me most is we see the succeeding generation on the horizon. So we have a fairly long-run view of this. What we're finding is that there are solutions even some of the most dire situations, and I think that's what keeps us going. 
the optimism stems from knowing people on the ground, talking to them, having meals with them, because I think this is what the key is. It's going to be people that make a difference, and we're really trying to work with people to help them do that.